Right, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to be here. Uh, I've, you know, thank you um, to Simon and uh, Sam for getting me involved in the uh, Global Perspectives project. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, today about the Roman town of uh, Venta Iconorum uh, or Caster by Norwich in, in Norfolk. Um, here it is. It's stuck out in the uh, just to the south of just to the south of Norwich. If you race past Norwich on the A47 towards the flesh pots of Great Yarmouth, uh, you'll see the site um, quite clearly. Now, it's a flat field uh, surrounded by a wall circuit and uh, a series of ditches of varying degrees of uh, impressiveness. Um, Despite the fact that it's visually from the ground uh, not a terribly uh, prepossessing site, it is a significant one, not least because it's one of only four uh, major Roman uh, regional capitals in the UK uh, that isn't buried beneath uh, a modern town. I'm not going to tell you very much about the site because uh, to do so would go straight into the uh, historical narratives uh, that I'm going to argue are one of the factors in uh, localising our archaeological sites and one of the things that act to exclude different uh, communities and uh, nationalities from engaging with them. But broadly speaking, it seems to have a history that lasts from uh, the later 1st century AD uh, until at least the at least the 8th century, uh, and possibly later with some activity flourishing around the church here, which, as you can see, sits um, quite clearly on the Roman street grid. And the Roman street grid uh, shows up very nicely from the air at certain times of year, and I'll come back to that uh, in a little while. Now, despite the importance of the site and its attractiveness as an archaeological site, those who engage with it are primarily uh, British and local. And there are a number of reasons for this. Um, to end up in uh, Norfolk, uh, by dint of geography, uh, you, have to be, you have to be going there. Norfolk is not a place that you pass through on the way uh, to uh, somewhere else, particularly. Nonetheless, a lot of people do come to Norfolk. Tourism is a major factor in the area. Uh, it contributes very significantly to the local economy, something like 18% of all employment, uh, 3.1 billion, um, three, over 3 million staying trips to Norfolk, staying a total of um, uh, yeah, over 12, 12 million nights. Uh, so there's a lot of people coming uh, to Norfolk from, uh, from outside. International tourism constitutes quite a significant uh, proportion of this. Uh, in 2015, it's recorded that there are 214,000 visits to the east of England uh, from China. Uh, Germany and the Netherlands also feature very strongly in this market. Now, the figures for this are slightly problematic because uh, they include Cambridge, which is, of course, a major uh, draw for, um, for these, these visitors. But the key thing is that international tourists are coming to the region of East Anglia in large numbers. So how do we get them to engage more with our sites, with our, our heritage? Um, and to me, something to be looked at is to move away from narratives that we find important and try to tap into what uh, different international visitors and indeed different visitors from uh, Britain actually actually want. Now, to start with, we have a major problem with Roman Britain. The way that Roman Britain has been constructed over the 20th century in particular 
turned it into a, a British story. Uh, the Romans came and were subsumed into Michael Gove's uh, beloved Our Island story. And famously in the uh, phrase of uh, Seller and Yeatman from 1066 and all that, um, the Romans are a good thing uh, because they were top nation and uh, came over and in turn helped Britain becoming uh, becoming top uh, top nation. And ultimately, this picture painted by Seller and Yeatman in uh, in the 1930s still is a, a dominant in some ways is a dominant narrative in. Uh, in, uh, in Roman, uh, looking at Roman Britain. Now the ways in which study of Roman Britain and the construction of Roman Britain as an idea have been, uh, were tied into the ideology of the British Empire, have been uh, very well, very well studied, uh, and I won't go into it here. But um, suffice to say that for many, Rome becomes uh, subsumed in a British story rather than part of uh, Britain participating in a wider transnational entity and as we'll seen in recent history yeah participating in wider transnational entities is perhaps not particularly a strong suit in uh, in Britain um, and indeed on reading some studies of Roman Britain uh, produced over the last sort of uh, 40 years or so, you would be uh, forgiven for thinking that the Roman Empire was centred on London and effectively stopped at Dover. And indeed, even those who rebelled against Rome, uh, such as Boudicca, have been uh, successfully su subsumed in an idea of Britishness. And it's a peculiar triumph uh, in some ways that both for Roman Britain, both the oppressors and the oppressed uh, can be successfully incorporated into a national myth. It's of course, as we've heard from Sam, it's not just uh, an international public who finds perhaps relatively little to attract them to traditional Roman Britain narratives. Um, scholars from other countries uh, have not uh, perhaps engaged with the archaeology of Roman Britain, certainly to the extent of coming and uh, leading projects here. Uh, while I've dug and led projects on sites in, uh, in Albania and I've worked in Italy and Jordan, we don't see many Italian archaeologists coming over and uh, leading projects on Roman sites in Britain. Um, and perhaps this is partly because the uh, because Italian archaeologists see Rome as the Romans saw it, essentially a Mediterranean entity, and Italian archaeologists, of course, work all over the uh, Mediterranean, and there's you know, obviously certain amounts of ideological baggage uh, associated with that as well. Um, Roman archaeology in the Western Empire does have, has had a strong tendency to stay within uh, national, uh, national borders, although our European archaeologists of all nationalities uh, dig in Italy and the Mediterranean. I argue we can trace a sort of legacy of this back to earlier uh, colonial adventures. Unlike Britain, other European countries with their own imperial pasts have subsumed Rome within their own national myths. So for our international markets, uh, particularly uh, a wider public, the story of Roman Britain that gets uh, people who study Roman Britain so excited is not uh, cutting much ice. But some Roman sites in Britain uh, transcends that national story and it's worth thinking about what they bring what they bring to the table and to my mind there are bigger factors key factors that arouse public interest 
in archaeological sites. And it strikes me that if we are to be successful in encouraging international interest in sites uh, such as Caister, um, and engaging groups also beyond the uh, traditional constituencies for museums and heritage, uh, we need to think about how we can respond to these different factors. Now, I'm going to look at some, I think, what for me are key factors that drive public interest in archaeological sites. Um, and first I want to think about the visual. The Roman Empire has an extraordinary visual iconography and we can see this visual language in any tourist brochure for sites in the Mediterranean. This is, uh, this is Jerash here in, in Jordan. And the visuals of Rome are a key part of its brand, brand identity. Uh, and obviously it's quite hard for a site like Caister to compete with something like, uh, with something like Jerash or with something like uh, Ephesus or Pompeii. And we can think about that the most visited uh, Roman sites in Britain, uh, Hadrian's Wall and Bath, here are sites which have strongly uh, visual elements. And although we can't necessarily compete with these visual elements, this should also give us some hope. After all, relatively few of the people who visit Hadrian's Wall um, really understand much of its complex history or indeed the fact that nobody actually knows what it was for. On a purely aesthetic sense, it's very striking, simply in its landscape setting. Caister struggles with this a little, but we should accept that visuals are quite fundamental. <coughs> I also want to think about mystery. Uh, the unexplained leaves a healthy gap for the imagination and the most popular archaeological sites often have mystery associated with them. Easter Island, uh, Stonehenge. In the words, legendary words of Nigel Tufnell from Spinal Tap, nobody knows, no one knows who they were or what they were doing. The urge to explain and be didactic is very strong in archaeology in archaeologists, but perhaps also this runs counter to what uh, people actually want from their sites. If you want to understand this, all you have to do is publish something or get out in the press saying that you are baffled. The public love a baffled expert and mystery baffles archaeologists, guarantees that you will get internet coverage uh, across the world. Um, this is uh, something that LiveScience.com picked up uh, from a site I published uh, near Caister in the Journal of Roman Archaeology. And uh, Live Science did quite a decent, uh, quite a decent piece on it. It was picked up in the matter by I think by about um, four o'clock that afternoon. It had reached India, and it was all over the world in a matter of hours. Uh, it got, of course, to the, uh, the Daily Mail, and the fact that it was a bizarre structure, winged structure, um, baffles archaeologists. I've also had YouTube uh, things where mystery skeleton baffles archaeologists. Uh, 150,000 views on that one. Everyone loves a baffled expert. Um, and these kind of transient five minutes of fame uh, things are the kind of uh, issues that the abstract for this session um, perhaps suggested we should move away from and I'll come back to this in a minute. We also have discovery. This I think links to mystery uh, and the fact of discovery, the accidental discovery, the race against time, the recovery of buried treasure all have uh, an attraction at Caister, we have the 
uh, extraordinary aerial photographs that first sparked interest in the site in uh, 1929. The fact that this buried landscape uh, periodically uh, emerges from the ground during dry periods of the year uh, retains an enduring uh, public fascination and it's perhaps something uh, that we should make uh, a little bit uh, a little bit more of. Uh, the power of such images is extremely important. We also have immediacy, the attraction of the new, and perhaps this is uh, a major selling point of archaeology. At Caister, we pulled in 15,000 visitors over four short excavation seasons. We weren't discovering jeweled chalices, but we were digging up pits and ditches and pottery. Our slightly facetious blog um, saw traffic from all over the world. You obviously can't read these stripes, but I'll test you on the flags uh, later on. We saw blog traffic from all over the world, although I think some of these uh, ones may well be automatic bots, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's clear that the blog proved a way of reaching international audiences that we weren't otherwise finding. And this use of social media is uh, particularly important. We can't dig all the time, but we can use social media to keep our sites in the public domain. Uh, there are many sites that are good at this. Uh, the Vindolanda Trust in particular I think is very very successful. They excavate every year and they have the attraction of the tablets to cash in on. But a, number, a lot of their social media posts are simply views of the site looking nice. It's something that keeps it in the public imagination. Actual footfall is now only part of the audience for archaeology and archaeological sites. Increasingly, people are using new technologies to access information both on and off site. And this is only going to increase as virtual reality becomes increasingly accessible uh, to in the both the home and the classroom. And experiencing sites remotely through immersive technologies is going to become mainstream. And uh, this presents significant opportunities for us. It's also something that separates generations. Uh, the, many of the, uh, the constituency for archaeology and heritage in terms of visitors uh, belongs to people over uh, often over the age of 60, not necessarily the generation who are growing up with this technology. This is going to very rapidly, uh, rapidly change. And it allows us to have a number of opportunities. In particular, it allows us to use augmented reality to blend the present landscape with a reconstructed one and gives us the potential to create and present multiple versions of the same site allowing us to move away from canonical interpretations. We've been experimenting with some of these things at uh, Caister using uh, AR and we've now got a new grant from the AHRC and EPSRC to develop this uh, further, creating characters and using different ideas, for example, of seasonality to create a much more immersive uh, version of this, this app. This also challenges us, however, um, and we as heritage practitioners have to become be alive to this. As these techniques become ubiquitous, the sheer novelty of using them won't be sufficient. We need to develop strategies uh, to encourage repeat use and visits. <coughs> uh, this might include ideas from uh, gaming. One of my son's favorite games is called Leap Day, which retains user engagement by releasing a new level for the game every day. Clearly this sort of thing has resourcing implications, but the idea is essentially the same as the Vindolanda Trust's Twitter strategy. In developing strategies to encourage this ongoing use, we are also enhancing the profile of our sites to encourage uh, real world visiting. 
Finally, I would conclude that we need to accept that our existing historical narratives for Roman Britain and other periods are potentially of relatively little significance when it comes to attracting international visitors to our sites, and we can't necessarily rely on them to do so. So I think we need to be alive to the possibilities of greater exploitation of the visual and the immediate, and also not to forget the indefinable magic of archaeology that attracted us all to the subject in the first place. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.